Greetings and salutations, friends. Jenny Lee here, and thank you for joining me today. I hope you're doing well, and if you're new here, hi and welcome. I've been going through and doing episodes on the real serial killers that have been featured on my favorite spooky show, American Horror Story. Today, we will be going over an, a still unsolved case. This is the Zodiac Killer. So I know that the last episode we did another unsolved, so back to back unsolved, but this one is not the victim. Disclaimer and trigger warning. The following podcast describes graphic violence in adult situations for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. The Zodiac Killer has only been mentioned and featured in the Devil's Night episode Hotel um, Season Episode 4. Because he's still unknown, they had him portrayed as a hooded figure. It's also briefly mentioned in Season 7 um, Cult, where it was suggested that Valerie was the Zodiac Killer. Our story begins in my hometown area of San Francisco, California in December 1968. I was just a sparkle in my mom's eye. That was a lovely sparkle. Um, while Zodiac was claimed, um, had claimed to have killed 37 people, only seven were confirmed. By some miracle, two of his victims actually survived. So I'm going to use um, his and him pronouns because the main suspect was male and he portrayed himself as male in his writings to the newspapers. On December 20th, 1968, high school students Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday were on Lake Herman Road on their first date. They were on their way to a Christmas concert at the Hogan High School after they had gone to a local restaurant for dinner. David parked his mother's car on a gravel turnout, um, aka Lover's Lane. Um, this was around 10.15. Another car pulled into the turnout just before 11 and parked next to them. It's believed that Betty Lou got out of the car first with David following, but he was shot in the head when he was halfway out. He then shot Betty Lou in the back five times um, as she was trying to run away. Her body was found 28 feet from the car. Their bodies were discovered by Stella Borges, who lived nearby. Unfortunately, the crime scene didn't yield any leads. On July 4th, 1969, just before midnight, Darlene Farron and Michael Magno drove into Blue Rock Springs in Vallejo, California. While they were sitting in the car, a random car pulled in also, but drove away. But it returned 10 minutes later and parked next to them. He then got out of the car and walked up to them carrying a large flashlight and a 9mm Luger. He shined the light into their eyes and started shooting. He shot them five times. Both of them were hit and several bullets were um, went through Michael and Darlene. Like a through, what they call like a through and through. Um, so it hit and, it, and they had exit wounds. Um, Zodiac started to walk away when he heard Michael moan. Then he double backed and shot um, them both two more times and then drove off. On July 5th, a man called the Vallejo police at 12.40 p.m., roughly 12 hours after they were attacked, and was taking credit for the murders and for what happened to Betty Lou and David. The police were able to trace the call and found the victims near the gas station where Zodiac placed the call from. Darlene was pronounced dead at the hospital and Michael survived being shot in the face, neck, and chest. Michael was even able to give a bit of a description of a 26 to 30 year old man 95 to 200 pounds, 5'8", and he was a white man with short, light brown, curly hair. Following the attacks on Darlene and Michael, on August 1st, 1969, the killer prepared three letters and was sent to the Vallejo Times Herald, San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. They were almost identical and described, a psych um, and described by a psychiatrist to have been written by, quote, someone you would expect to be brooding and isolated, end quote. Um, and that he was taking credit for the shootings at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs. Each letter also had one third of a 48 symbol cryptogram, which the killer claimed to contain his identity. Zodiac demanded that the cryptogram be printed in the front page of each paper, and if they didn't, he would, quote, cruise around all weekend killing lone people in the night, then move on to killing again until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. The Chronicle decided to publish its copy of the cryptogram on page four the next day. Not page one, page four. 
I'm kind of okay with this, but I also feel like their calling is bluff in a way, which is dicey when you've got someone who is not scared to kill people. The article printed the code and had a quote from the Vallejo police chief, Jack E. Stiltz, saying, quote, we're not satisfied that the letter was written by the murderer and challenged the writer to send a copy of the letter with more details. Oh, end quote. And he challenged <laughs> the writer to send a letter with more details to prove he's the real killer. He was essentially the calling the Zodiac's bluff, which worked. The murders that were threatened for the weekend, they didn't happen. Thank goodness. Um, but the paper did eventually publish all three parts of the cryptogram. On August 7th, a second letter was sent to the San Francisco Examiner with the greeting, quote, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking, end quote. This is the first known time that the killer actually used his name, or the name he chose, rather. The letter was in response to the police chief's request for more details as proof. The Zodiac included details about the murders that hadn't been made known to the public and said that once they cracked the code, quote, they will have me, end quote. Be careful what you ask for, because on August 8th, 1969, Donald and Betty Hardin of Salinas, California, cracked the code. It contained a misspelled message with references um, to the most dangerous game, which is a book. Uh, Zodiac indicated that he was collecting slaves for his afterlife. Um, what? Anyway, but it also seems that Zodiac is a big fat liar because there's no true indication of who his real identity is and he reasons that giving away his identity would slow down or stop his slave collection. The whole decipher text for the three cryptograms is, quote, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because it is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and all that I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. End quote. The last 18 letters still haven't been deciphered. And if you try to read it, it sounds like gibberish. <laughs> like trying to read through a sneeze. It's like... <laughs> uh, I make myself laugh. Okay. And if you read the paragraph for yourself, which it is out there, obviously, just be aware that it's full of run-on sentences and so many misspellings. For someone who put a lot of effort into the cryptogram, one would think he would spell check. Just saying. I know it's the 60s, but if you're trying to be an evil genius, at least spell correctly. On September 27, 1969, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, both students at Pacific Union College, were picnicking at Lake Berryessa on a small island connected by a sandy walkway called Twin Oak Ridge, which is also like a sandbar, when a white man, who is described as being 5'11", 170 pounds, not 175, 170, approached them wearing a black executioner's hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eyes and a bib thing on his chest with the cross circle symbol on it in white. He came up to the couple, gun in hand, and he told them he was an escaped convict where he had killed a guard and, told, and stole a car and that he needed their car and any money they had so he could get to Mexico. He said he couldn't keep using the other stolen car because it was, quote, too hot, end quote. To me, what this may mean back then was that the car had overheated and wouldn't run. There's a life lesson for you. Always keep some coolant in your car because you don't know what's going to happen. Zodiac told Cecilia to tie up Brian before Zodiac tied her up. He then checked Brian's hands and discovered that she tied them loosely. And Brian began thinking that this was one weird robbery when Zodiac pulled out a knife and stabbed him six times. He then turned and stabbed Cecilia 10 times. Zodiac then walked to their car and wrote on the door in a black felt tip pen, like a Sharpie, Vallejo, 12 20 68, 
September 27, 69, 6.30 by knife. Those were the dates of the murders. Plus, he put the circle cross as his calling card also on the door. At 7.40 p.m. Porty? Wow. Okay. 7.40 p.m. that same day, Zodiac called the Napa County Sheriff's Office from a payphone saying he wished to, quote, report a murder. No, a double murder, end quote, before telling the operator that he was the killer. The payphone was found off the hook at the Napa Car Wash on Main Street, which was only a few blocks from the sheriff's office, but was 27 miles from the crime scene. So he booked it to let the cops know, but he was not far away from the cops, just too far away from the crime scene. Detectives were able to lift a still wet palm print from the phone, but were never able to match it with any suspects. Back on the island, there was a man and his son fishing nearby who heard the screams of the victims. They got help to them faster than the sheriffs, they actually call, contacted the park rangers. So mad props to the to the park rangers for showing up. That's awesome. Sheriff's deputies Dave Collins and Ray Land were the first law enforcement on the scene. And Cecilia was still conscious when Deputy Collins arrived and was able to give a detailed description of the attacker. How amazing is that? Like, honestly, I don't know if I would be able to to give a detailed recollection of what happened after being stabbed 10 times. Is it 10 times? Yeah, she was stabbed 10 times. I think I, I don't know what I would do. I mean, I've experienced true pain. I've had health issues. I've had two children. So I've experienced some real pain, but I don't know if I would be able to register. Maybe your brain just turns it off so that way you can survive. I don't want to find out. It's one of those mysteries I don't want to solve with first-hand knowledge. Um, she, however, did slip into a coma in transit to the hospital and never woke up. She passed away two days later. Brian, however, survived and was able to give his statement and spoke to the press. He worked with Napa County Detective Ken Marlowe, who worked on this case until his very last day before he retired from the department of eight, um, 18 years later in 1987. I was five. Don't do math. You're not going to find out how old I am now. But I look great. Okay. October 11th, 1969. A white man got into a taxi cab on Mason and Jerry Streets in San Francisco the passenger asked the driver, Paul Stein, to take him to uh, Presidio Heights on the corner of Washington and Maple Street. Paul drove one block past Maple to Cherry Street, but no one knows why. The person would be annoyed, yes, but it's just a block, no biggie. I miss turns far too often than I care to admit, and if we're going on a road trip with me, it's a known fact that at some point we will have to backtrack a tad because I missed a turn and we take the scenic route. It's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. However, if you're an unbalanced person like the Zodiac, well, then it's a crime punishable by death. This passenger shot Paul once in the head with a 9mm handgun, took his wallet and his keys. He also tore off a section of Paul's shirt, like down here at the bottom. Um, and this was all seen by three teenagers across the street at 9.55 p.m. While the man was wiping down the car, the teens were calling 911 and told the police what was going on. They watched um, him start walking away toward the Presidio, which was one block away. Two blocks away from where patrol officers Don Fook and Eric Zelms responded to the call. And they saw a white man walking on the sidewalk, going east on Jackson Street, stepping onto a stairway leading up the front yard of one of the homes in the north side of the street. The whole encounter lasted only moments. Super brief. Literally like walking past each other, passing a stranger on the street. Officer Fuchs said the man was between 35 and 45 years old, 5'10", with a crew cut, very similar to the description given by the teens, but it's just a bit older. They said between 25 and 30 years old, 5'8 to 5'9". The distinction between what the teens described and what was conveyed to the officers from the dispatcher, from what the, they told them, was to look for a black suspect. 
So the officers drove past a man without stopping to question him. I'm sorry, what? You are patrolling a relatively quiet neighborhood and a murder was just witnessed and you saw someone similar to the description or height and age. You should question them no matter what ethnicity a person is. Granted, again, this is 1969, not now. Even if it wasn't the suspect, maybe that man saw something the teens didn't. My lord, common sense is definitely a gift that some didn't receive. Anyway, they were told to look for a black man, but because they were going based on the description, uh, no suspects were quote-unquote found. This is considered the last official confirmed murder of the Zodiac. Paul's murder was initially thought to be a routine robbery gone wrong. However, on October 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac claiming credit for the murder and actually sent a segment of the torn shirt as proof. The teens worked with the police um, sketch artist to get a composite put together. It took a few days to get all the details possible. Let's face it, everyone remembers something different because everyone's brain works differently. And detectives Bill Armstrong and Dave Toshi? Tochi? Toshi? Sorry, I forgot how to Google his name. Professor Google will correct me later. Sorry, I don't mean to butcher it. I really am sorry. Um, anyway, he's from the San Francisco Depl Police Department. Estimated that 2,500 suspects over several years match the description. On October 14, 1969, the Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac. It also contained part of Paul's bloody shirt as proof, stating he was next going to um, target a school bus full of children. He wrote, quote, just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out, end quote. That disturbs me. I hope it disturbs you too, because a statement like that should. At 2 p.m. on October 20th, someone claimed to be Zodiac called the Oakland PD demanding F. Lee Bailey or Melvin Belly, both prominent lawyers of the area, appear on AM San Francisco. Melvin Belly was available and did go on the show. The host, Jim Dunbar, appealed to the viewers to keep the lines open, and someone who claimed to be Zodiac called several times, and Melvin asked the caller for a less ominous name, so he said Sam but that it wasn't his true identity because he didn't want to be sent to the gas chamber, which was the death penalty at that time in California. Melvin was able to arrange a rendezvous to meet the caller outside a store on Mission Street in Daly City, but Zodiac no-showed. The call was eventually traced back to a patient in a mental institution, and it was concluded that the man who called in was not the true Zodiac killer. On November 8, 1969, Zodiac mailed a card with a new cryptogram with 340 characters. This one is commonly referred to as Z340, which went unsolved for over 51 years. During the start of the COVID pandemic, it was um, finally solved, um, which kind of in a twisted way makes sense. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. We were all in our houses trying to be socially distant and careful. And on December 5th, 2020, an international team of private civilians, including American software engineer David or Oran, David Oranchak, an Australian mathematician Sam Blake, and um, a Belgian programmer Jarval Ayak, the message said that he wasn't quote unquote Sam, who called the show and denied being scared of the gas chamber quote because it will send me to paradise all the sooner. End quote. The team gave their findings to the FBI, and they actually verified the discovery, but the message didn't give any new de details on, on his identity. Which is weird. If he's not scared of the gas chamber, and he does, he's okay with dying, then how come he doesn't want to tell who his true identity is when he's so anxious to be in paradise? Hmm. On November 9th, 1969, Zodiac mailed a seven-page letter saying that two cops stopped and spoke with him on October 11th 
just a few minutes after he shot Paul. Parts of the letter were published in the Chronicle a few days later on the 12th. On that same day, Officer Folk, who had written a memo detailing what happened on patrol that night, which did state they did speak with a white man near the scene of the murder. Oh, how the tables have turned. What a tangle web we weave. While the Zodiac never took credit, there is speculation that there are other victims he left behind. Robert George Domingo, 18, and Linda Faye Edwards, 17, were shot and killed on June 4, 1963, at a beach near Gavotia. They speculate that this may be one of his first victims because of the similarities on the attack at Lake Berryessa six years later. Sherry Jo Bates, 18, was stabbed so severely she was almost decapitated on October 30, 1966, at Riverside City College. The possible connection appeared uh, four years later when San Francisco Chronicle reporter Paul Avery got a tip regarding similarities between the Zodiac Method and Sherry Jo murder. Donna Ann Last, 23, was last seen on September 6, 1970 in State Line, Nevada. So this one is a bit odd. There is no body. So there was a postcard sent to the Chronicle on March 22, 1971 at when it was ad for Forest Pines condos, which are near Lake Tahoe. To this day, what I was able to find in my research, no new evidence has been found on her disappearance and no true link to the Zodiac. It's just speculation because he is an attention whore. He wants the, the attention. He is the one who kept turning in the victims. He could have waited for them to be discovered, but no. He's like, hey, guess what I just did? He wants the attention. He's a sociopath. Okay. Kathleen Johns, 22, disappeared on March 22, 1970 on Highway 132, west of Modesto. She escaped with her infant daughter from a man who abducted them and just drove around for an hour and a half between Stockton and Patterson, California. In her report, she said she was driving from San Bernardino to Petula to visit her mom. She had her 10-month-old daughter and was also seven months pregnant. She was heading west towards um, Modesto when a car came up behind her and started laying on his horn and flashing his headlights. Normally when someone does that, it means that something like there's something wrong with your car. They're trying to get your attention. So if you're new to driving and someone does that to you, pay attention, like pull off, cause they also might be trying to get around you, but pull off safely, but don't do, try and like see if you can pull into a garage or not a garage, but a gas station that has like a servicing garage, someplace that's lighted and has cameras because of this. <laughs> You don't want this to happen to you. I don't want this to happen to you. And these are things I tell my 17-year-old who's, you know, trying to learn to drive. And these are just life tips. They don't tell you this in the DMV books. It's just life tips and common sense. And it's some... Eh. <laughs> I'm not ready for him to be a driver. <laughs> oh, anyway... She pulled off to the shoulder, and then the man parked behind her, came up to her car, and said he saw her right rear wheel was wobbling and offered to tighten the lug nuts. Again, don't let someone do this. You say thank you, and you keep going, because then you can take it to um, a real mechanic and have it looked at. Plus, if your tire's wobbly, you're going to hear it. It's like a weird thumping sound. You'll hear it was that my grandfather used to say drive by the seat of your pants because when you're sitting in that driver's seat you can feel how your car runs and if it starts vibrating or there's a different sound or a different feel it means that something's wrong so drive by the seat of your pants people it'll save you some money in the long run um, so he offered to tighten her lug nuts so when he was done, he drove off, but Kathleen started to drive off, and her wheel fell off almost immediately. <sighs> he did the old switcheroo. He didn't tighten anything. There was nothing wrong with her wheel before he pulled her over. Well, the man came back and offered um, her a ride to the nearest gas station. 
During the ride, they passed several service stations and gas stations, and the men never stopped. Shocker. He had just kept driving back and forth on the roads near Tracy. When Kathleen um, asked why he wasn't stopping, he would change the subject. Eventually, he had to stop at an intersection, and that's when she jumped out with her, da with her daughter. She booked it. She ran and hid in a field while he came after them, searching with a flashlight, calling out for her, saying he wasn't going to hurt her. Eventually, he gave up and drove off. Kathleen then thumbed up, um, thumbed her right, you know, hitchhiked, um, to the nearest police station. Pretty sure no one would pick up a hitchhiker these days. Unless they had a child. But then again, that's a good con. You can't trust people, man. My goodness. True crime has taught me that I can't trust anybody for anything. <laughs> and I want to. <laughs> so awful. Oh, goodness. Okay, so she hitchhiked um, for a ride to the nearest police station, which was in Patterson, California. While she was giving her statement to the sergeant on duty, she saw the composite sketch of Paul Stein's killer and said that was the man who abducted her and her daughter. But fear that he might come back and kill them, the sergeant had them wait in, um, in the dark at the nearby Mills restaurant. Kind of like a safe house, but not because the restaurant was just closed, so they just kept them there so that way he, they wouldn't be seen. Her car was found by the police. Um, but not before it was gutted and torched. That's right. He went back, tore up the car, and then lit it on fire. The man clearly did not want her to get very far. There are a few conflicting reports on her account of what happened. Some say the man threatened to kill them the whole time while driving around in an effort to convince her not to run. And there are reports that he walked into the field looking for them. But in her own police report, she said he didn't leave his vehicle. I choose to believe what she said in the police versus what people speculate. But there is some validity to the speculations. Like, why didn't she try to escape sooner? But you never know how you're going to react in a situation until you're in it. It's easy to say what you would have done. But that doesn't mean you'll be able to unless it happens to you. For a few years after the murders stopped, Zodiac still communicated with authorities um, throughout 1970. On April 20th, 1970, the Zodiac wrote, My name is blank, which had a 13-character cipher that still hasn't been decoded to this day. Which leads me to think that, like, okay, so they cracked the really big one, the 400 one. So I'm thinking that parts of the cipher... Um, are not real. They are entirely random and not meant to be solved. And I think that's one of them. He also denied being responsible for a bombing at San Francisco police station on February 18, 1970, but did say there is more glory to killing a cop than a Sid because a cop can shoot back. It also had a little diagram on it with a circle cross on it that um, the Zodiac used, you know, his signature. I said Zodiac 10, SFPD 0. He's keeping score. Zodiac also sent a greeting card that was postmarked April 28, 1970 to the Chronicle saying, quote, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast, end quote. He also said he wanted to start seeing people wearing, quote, some nice Zodiac buttons, end quote. Okay, so remember how he said his next target was going to be school children? So it was thought that what he meant was the blast was for the school children. And he wanted to start seeing people wear his symbol on those trendy pin-on buttons. I know we're not talking about an even-killed person, but that's ridiculous. Zodiac sent a follow-up letter on June 26, 1970, indicating he was upset that he didn't see people wearing those buttons and took credit for another murder. Quote, I shot a man sitting in a parked car with a 38. End quote. He was referring to a police sergeant, Richard Reddit, who was shot in the head while in his squad car while writing up a parking ticket. He died 15 hours later. The SFPD still denies that the Zodiac was involved and his murder is still unsolved. To me, that's good police work. 
The easy out to close the case would be give credit to the Zodiac. However, there's no evidence that he was involved. In fact, because we don't have proof, like when he was standing uh, in pieces of Paul's shirt, it could be a copycat trying to take credit for Zodiac to boost his numbers, which is ridiculous. In the same letter, the Zodiac also included a road map of the San Francisco Bay area on the image of Mount Diablo. The Zodiac had drawn a crossed circle similar to his signature and also wrote on the top 0369, an instruction stating the zero indicated magnetic north. It also had a 32 letter cipher that when solved would lead, the, lead to the bomb. He had it set to go off in the fall. The cipher was never decoded and no bomb ever went off. If this was really from the true Zodiac, he was trying to start a frenzy and sent authorities on a wild goose chase. On July 24th, 1970, Zodiac took credit for Kathleen and her daughter's abduction, but he took credit four months after the fact, which seems very out of character for him. If you remember, after the previous murders, he took credit as soon as he could. He wanted the authorities to know that it was him. I'm not going to go into more detail about the crazy letters he would send to the authorities because they didn't really make sense. Like, he kept trying to cre take credit for the things he wanted to do or thought about, but never really happened. One thing that did seem interesting is, while there's no bomb, there were still people working on the map, which makes sense because you have a very dangerous person doing very bad things, and you're not going to dismiss anything without looking into it. In the same letter, he takes credit for Kathleen's abduction. He gave a clue about the map. He said, uh, quote, P.S., the Mount Diablo code concerns radians, number of inches along the radians, end quote. That doesn't make sense to me, but in 1981, Zodiac researcher Gareth Penn led the discovery that a radian angle would put on the map following Zodiac's instructions it pointed to the locations to two of the Zodiac attacks. Well, there you go. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, they are still getting tips almost every day on who may be the Zodiac. There are people writing, emailing, tweeting in their theories of who it may be. Some think it's the creepy neighbor or their father, like in the Black Dahlia case, or even one of the original cops on the case. The ciphers have been decoded in so many different ways, naming so many different people one of them was being Arthur Lee Allen, a convicted child molester in Vallejo, who died in 1992 without being charged. Just like with any unsolved murder, there's a lot of speculation, but this one is extreme because of how famous the case got. And I'll admit, the cryptogram and the ciphers are very intriguing. I love a good puzzle, and even I can't get a grip on how these were decoded. He didn't use the same code twice, so whoever... Um, he is is definitely a genius type with a psychot with a psychotic idea. If you know anyone who is or may have information on the Zodiac's identity, please call the San Francisco Police Department's tip line at 415-575-4444. And you can also text a tip anonymously to 847411. Um, only true, credible tips only, please. And I will put those numbers in the description below so you can use them. Again, true tips only. You don't want to send the officers on a wild goose chase. It's not fair to them. And you don't want... It's just not cool. Don't do that. Um, also, just as a side note, if you've seen the new Batman movie with Zoe Kravitz and Robert Pattinson, then you may have noticed that the Riddler's costume looks very super similar to the Zodiacs. You would be right. You get a star. They used it as the inspiration for his look. If you haven't seen it yet, I do recommend seeing it. I'm not going to give any spoilers out. It's still in theaters. What's today? Today is April 23rd, 2022. Um, yeah, it's still in theaters, and now it's on HBO Max. So you have two ways to see it as of right now. I love the movie. It was so well done, and uh, the teenager also loved it, and we've watched it twice already. <laughs> and if you need some help, with the timeline, my oldest son, the teenager, thinks that the movie takes place at, right after the TV show Gotham ended, which actually totally makes sense when you watch it. No spoilers, I'm just saying. So again, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out with me again today. And remember, in a world where you can choose to do anything, choose kindness. Bye, guys.